In a move that I'm sure will surprise no one, there is a facially unconstitutional piece of legislation snaking its way through Congress and on categorical imperatives today. That is what we are going to be talking about. H.R. 51 and D.C. statehood. Hey, greetings and welcome back once again to Categorical Imperatives. As always, I am your host, Lockheed Liberal, and I do want to thank you all so much for being here with me today. Uh, now, if you are new to the program, I especially want to welcome you. Uh, this is a podcast where we are going to be using legal theory and moral philosophy to discuss current events related to law, politics, and culture. And I have some good news uh, and, and some bad news uh, for you guys here. Uh, the bad news is. Uh, that I had some technical difficulties on Friday and I wasn't able to uh, get my interview recorded with Scott Horton that I was planning on, uh, although we have rescheduled for next week. Uh, the good news is that I had some te technical difficulties and I wasn't able to record uh, my interview with Scott Horton last week. And that means you guys uh, still have a chance to uh, head on over to my Patreon page and sign up to become a patron for as little as two bucks a month. And if you do, you can leave me your questions over there for me to put to Scott uh, during our interview, which will be uh, now next week, next Wednesday, I believe. So, uh, yeah. Otherwise, you can also, if you would like to support the show, you can go to PayPal or Venmo as well. But Patreon is the place to be. Uh, I'm really trying to get this going if I can. Uh, and I have a lot of extra perks that you get when you sign up at the Patreon over there uh, that you don't get uh, from other places where you may be uh, putting your financial support behind the show. So uh, anyways, enough uh, whoring myself out here. Let's just get to the topic for today, huh? So uh, the latest democratic scheme to take what they cannot fairly win uh, is snaking its way through Congress, and that is H.R. 51. Now, in the past, I have discussed their uh, encouragement of a national popular vote, uh, their desire for court packing, and their schemes for democratic representation in the Senate. Now, this latest effort uh, just passed in the House, uh, and it is seeking to grant D.C. statehood. I don't know, March. Trying is the first step towards failure. <clears throat> mm. Anyways, while H.R. Uh, 51's obviously partisan scheme to give one party a clear advantage is a problem in itself, and it is one worth taking note of, uh, it seems to me that the only, that seems to be the only criticism this bill has been Getting, despite there being much more serious constitutional issues at stake. I mean, first of all, they are talking about making a state out of land ceded by Maryland for the express purpose of making a federal district exclusively under Congress's jurisdiction. Uh, in fact, both Maryland and Virginia had initially ceded territory as a gift for that distinct purpose. Uh, and in fact, D.C. used to be larger because initially Virginia had ceded a piece of territory for the same person uh, purpose. This territory, though, was uh, retroceded back to Virginia. We'll be getting into that a little bit later, too, here. My point being, though, that if the uh, residents of D.C. want statehood, uh, that land can and should be retroceded to Maryland. Those citizens would become Marylanders once again, and they would be fully represented by Maryland senators and representatives. They are not doing that because that is not what they actually want. What they want is extra democratic representation that D.C. statehood would provide. If it was about fair representation, I'm sure Maryland would be more than happy to take their land back. 
However, like I said, that is not what is of greatest concern to me. What is of greater concern to me is the way that they are seeking to make two fundamental changes to the Constitution itself through the normal legislative process. Now, H.R. 51 clearly states that it would repeal the 23rd Amendment. Uh, this amendment gives the residents of D.C. electoral votes for presidential elections. The text of the amendment reads that uh, the district constituting the seat of the government of the United States shall appoint in such a manner as Congress may direct a number of electors uh, of president and vice president equal to the whole number of senators and representatives in Congress to which the district would be entitled if it were a state, but in no event more than the least populous state. They shall, in addition to those appointed by the states, but they shall be considered for the purposes of the election of president and vice president to be electors appointed by a state. And they shall meet in the district and perform such duties as provided by the 12th article of the amendment. Now, additionally, uh, this legislation would also repeal the Enclave Clause. And this says, uh, Congress shall have the power to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles square as may, by session of particular states, and acceptance of Congress become the seat of the government of the United States. Now, in Federalist Number 43, James Madison explained the need for a federal district subject to Congress's exclusive jurisdiction and separate from the territory and authority of any single state. Madison said, The indispensable necessity of complete authority at the seat of government carries its own evidence with it. It is a power exercised by every legislature of the Union, and I might say of the world, by virtue of its general supremacy. Without it, not only the public authority might be insulted and its proceedings interrupted with impunity, but a dependence on the members of the general government on the state, comprehending the seat of government for protection of the exercise of their duty, might bring on the national councils and imputation of awe or influence equally dishonorable to the government and dissatisfactory to other members of the Confederacy. Now, Madison's concerns about insults to the public authority were not speculative. In June 1783, several hundred uh, unpaid and angry Continental soldiers had marched on Philadelphia, menacing the Confederation Congress that was meeting there in Independence Hall. Pennsylvania refused all requests for assistance, and after two days, Congress had to adjourn so its members could flee to New Jersey. Now, this, in uh, this incident made a lasting impression. Uh, the framers referenced it over and over again in defending their provision for a federal town, which anti-federalists persisted in visualizing as a sink of corruption and a potential nursery for tyrants, and in a way, they were both right. Um, in fact, however, uh, the framers understood that the need for a territory in which the general government exercised full sovereignty not beholden to any state was an inherent necessity of the federal system itself. Now, once the Constitution had come into effect in 1789, the location of the capital inevitably came more contentious than its necessity. Uh, in fact, both New York and Pennsylvania were desperate for this plum. Uh, and in fact, Benjamin Franklin had earlier urged Pennsylvania's legislature to grant the land literally moments after the proposed Constitution was first read to that body. Now, in 1790, the first Congress wrangled over this issue, and the resultant Compromise of 1790 provided for a southern site near the fall line of the Potomac River. In exchange, the southern states agreed to Alexander Hamilton's proposal that a new federal government would assume the state's revolutionary war debt 
and that arrangement was sealed in a meeting between Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, by which the South gave their capital. Uh, Philadelphia did remain the temporary capital for 10 years, uh, but also by which the federal government obtained practical control of national monetary policy. And, as I said, Maryland and Virginia ceded 10 miles square of the respective sides of the river, and the government finally moved to its permanent but still at the time, rude and undeveloped seat in 1800. Now, the week before John Adams left the presidency in 1801, Congress had established a government for the District of Columbia, dividing it into two counties, the counties of Washington and Alexandria. Now, this law provided that the laws then existing in the two counties deriving from Virginia and Maryland respectively would remain in force until modified by Congress. A realization that the original bill had left the district without a judiciary prompted Congress to provide four justices of the peace to be appointed by the president. Uh, and this was in fact the act that eventually led to the case of Marbury versus Madison in 1803. Now, in 1846, the Virginia portion of the original territory of Columbia, encompassing Old Town Alexandria and Arlington County, was retroceded by Congress to the Commonwealth. The constitutionality of that act has never actually been determined. However, in 1875, the Supreme Court dismissed, for lack of standing, a case brought by a Virginia taxpayer who argued that he was properly subject to the district's then less onerous tax burden. The court noted the plaintiffs sought to vicariously raise a question that neither Virginia nor the federal government had desired to make, uh, and this was a case known as Phillips v. Payne. So over the last two centuries, Congress has experimented with varying, uh, varying methods of home rule as well as with direct congressional rule. Uh, the history is really complex, including periods of county home rule, uh, as well as city uh, divided into Georgetown, Alexandria, and Washington self rule. And since seventeen, or excuse me, since nineteen seventy three, the district enjoys substantial home rule with an elected mayor and city council. Though under the Constitution, Congress could revoke or alter this arrangement at any time. Now, today, the most controversial aspect of Congress's authority over the district is the fact that Washington, D.C. residents cannot elect members to Congress. The 23rd Amendment gave the district the right to participate in presidential elections, but not in congressional elections. Instead, the residents elect a non-voting delegate to the House of Representatives. Now, because of the district's unique character as a federal city, neither the framers nor Congress accorded the inhabitants the right to elect members of the House of Representatives or the Senate. In exchange, however, the district's residents received a multifarious benefit of the nation's capital. And as Joseph Story noted in his commentaries on the Constitution of the United States, there can be little doubt that the inhabitants composing the district would receive with thankfulness such a blessing since their own importance would be thereby increased, their interests be subserved, and their rights be under the immediate protection of the representatives of the whole union. So, in effect, the framers believed that the residents were virtually represented uh, in the federal interest for a strong and prosperous capital. Now, there have been a number of efforts to change this original design, including a proposed constitutional amendment that was passed by Congress in 1977 that would have granted the District of Columbia congressional voting representation as if it were a state. This amendment, however, was not ratified in the seven-year period established by Congress. Uh, now, other proposals have included a retrocession of most or all of the District of Maryland. Now, this is a plan that Attorney General Robert Kennedy in 1964 deemed as both impractical and unconstitutional. 
Uh, and it is also include uh, people seeking the admission of Washington, D.C. to the Union as the 51st state. And in 2000, the court rejected a series of arguments suggesting that the district's inhabitants were, on various constitutional and policy grounds, entitled to voting representation in Congress without an amendment. Uh, this was a case known as Adams versus Clinton. Now, more recently, the courts have rejected efforts to invalidate a congressionally imposed limit on the district's ability to tax non-residence commuters. Uh, and this is a case known as Banner v. United States. And in that case, the court noted that, simply put, the district and its residents are the subject of Congress's unique powers exercise to address the unique circumstances of our nation's capital. Now, to even discuss something like D.C. statehood requires addressing the fundamental constitutional problems with the proposal. These constitutional amendments must be a non-negotiable requirement. Really, only then could the practical problems of their proposal be discussed. After all, an independent federal territory comprising the seat of government and subject to the ultimate authority of Congress was a critical part of the framers' original notion of a federal union of indestructible states. Now, D.C. statehood advocates will say that the new state would include a small federal enclave, thus making a constitutional amendment unnecessary. But few and far between are the constitutional scholars who believe that doing that will render a constitutional amendment unnecessary. The reason being that while the bill contemplates leaving in place the district as a tiny federal enclave essentially consisting of the National Paul, a National Mall, excuse me, uh, and a few bits of land and certain buildings that surround it, uh, including the White House and the Supreme Court, and perhaps a few other buildings. However, the Constitution draws no distinction between the seat of the government of the United States and the district in which that government is seated. In effect, the proposal would strip Congress's present authority over today's District of Columbia simply by redefining it as a district. Now, the proposal's constitutional problems don't end with that text and its implications, however. In fact, they go to a core constitutional principle, the doctrine of enumerated powers. And we are mainly talking about Article 1, Section 8. Uh, and the fact is, nowhere in there is Congress given the power to carve out a 51st state from the present District of Columbia. And this is a point that was well stated in 1963 by Robert Kennedy when speaking on a different iteration of this, uh, where he, he was ruling on a related proposal. Uh, and at the point, this has been repeated, uh, excuse me, and this point has been repeated by every Justice Department uh, since then. They have all addressed the D.C. statehood and related questions, and they have all, with only one exception, concluded that Congress has no authority to alter the static of the district legislatively. Unsurprisingly, that one exception was uh, Attorney General Eric Holder. Uh, this really isn't surprising given the Obama administration's constitutional record. Uh, and after receiving a similar opinion in 2009 from the Department's Office of Legal Counsel regarding a D.C. voting rights bill that was then pending before Congress, Holder rejected that advice and sought the opinion of the Solicitor General's office. Now, lawyers there told him that they could defend the legislation if it were challenged after its enactment. And I really find the ambiguity of that absolutely precious. Of course, the Solicitor General's office can defend the legislation. That's its job. Its job is to defend all legislation, no matter how unconstitutional it may turn out to be. 
but there's more. Just as the original creation of the district required the consent of the contributing state, so too, with all agreements, does any change in the terms of that grant require the consent of the parties. And Maryland has given no indication that it would consent to having a new state created on its border from what formerly used to be part of their state. Now, at the least, previous proposals have received little purport little support from the free state uh, and plus again we have the previously mentioned problem of the needed amendment to repeal the current 23rd amendment and it is only once we get past those strictly constitutional issues that we can talk about the practical issues as well remember madison's stated purpose for the creation of this federal district it is crucial that Congress could exercise exclusive jurisdiction over that district, thus keeping the federal government from being dependent on any particular state, and equally important so that no state would either be dependent on the federal government or disproportionately influential on that government. And this proposal fails on both of those counts. So, essentially, I mean, entirely surrounded by this new state that we are talking about, the federal government would be entirely dependent on it for all manner of services, everything from electrical power, water, sewers, snow removal, police, and fire protection, and so much else that today is part of an integrated jurisdiction under the authority of Congress. Yet, with this proposal, Congress would have no ultimate authority over any of that as it does today. Now, the 58-page Constitution that D.C. voters ratified in 1982 included provisions that required the state to provide jobs or adequate income to all city residents and to allow firefighters and police the right to strike. And given that, uh, this does not grant very much confidence in the feasibility of this plan. Uh, and as was pointed out uh, by constitutional scholar Roger Pylon uh, of the Cato Institute uh, in 2013, while he was testifying before Congress on a past iteration of the same functional concept, neither would the new district be independent of the federal government, practically speaking. He pointed out in Federalist 51 that Madison discussed the multiplicity of interests that define a proper state with urban and rural parts, with economic activity sufficient and sufficiently varied to be and to remain an independent entity. That hardly describes the District of Columbia. Washington is largely a one-industry town. With its economy closely tied in almost every way to the federal government, and that would not likely change if most of the city became a state. Indeed, uh, as Roger Pylon called this New Columbia, is what he referred to this new uh, state as. He says, indeed, New Columbia would be our only city state. No longer under the exclusive authority of Congress that would now be dependent on Congress. New Columbia would be in a position to exert influence on the federal government far in excess of that of any other state. The potential for dishonorable influence about which Madison warned is palpable. A district so reduced as under this proposal would be utterly dependent and unable to effectively control its place of business, rendering it susceptible to such influence. Now, this consideration has all the more weight with the gradual accumulation of the public improvement at the stationary resident of the government, which would be uh, both too great a public pledge to be left in the hands of a single state and would create so many obstacles to a removal of the government as still further to abridge its necessary independence. The extent of this federal district is sufficiently cir circumscribed to satisfy every jealousy of an opposite nature. 
And to kind of close out here, uh, as Madison pointed out in Federalist 43, as it is to be appropriated to this use with the consent of the state ceding it, as the state will no doubt provide in the compact for the right of and the consent of the citizens inhabiting it, and the inhabitants will find sufficient inducements of interest to become willing parties to this session as they will have had their voice in the election of the government, which is to exercise authority over them as a municipal legislature for local purposes, derived from their own suffrages, will of course be allowed them, and as the authority of the legislature of the state and of the inhabitants of their seat a part of it, to concur with the session, will be derived from the whole people of the state in their adoption of the Constitution, every imaginable objection seems to be obviated. Well, that is going to do it for me today. I, I hope you enjoy the show. Uh, make sure to leave me a comment down below. Let me know what you thought about the show. If you liked it, uh, smash that like button. Uh, and I, I ask, if you enjoyed this episode, I always ask people, uh, just if you would think of one person you know who you think would also like this episode and just send it to them and just uh, help me grow the channel that way. And if you would do that much for me, uh, I would really be very grateful. Uh, and again, also, if you want to go over to my Patreon page, if you become a patron anytime between now and uh, next Wednesday, so uh, a little over a week from now, when I interview Scott Horton, uh, any patrons who are signed up over on Patreon can uh, leave a question for me to put to Scott during the interview. So I would encourage you all to go and do that. But anyways, uh, until next time, this has been Lockheed and Liberal for Categorical Imperatives. And as always, De Lenda S. Carthago.